cases were joined with lawsuits from Delaware, the District of Columbia, and Topeka, Kansas. Well, they all came to the Supreme Court at separate times. That the court recognized that all of them had the same issue involved. So to save the time of the court, what they wanted was to get them all here at one time, and let's decide this issue once and for all. Stroke of genius, genius, really. The issue was one of the most important issues that had faced the court in its history. Integrity of the court would be at stake as to whatever it did. That court was seriously divided along philosophical lines and rarely issued unanimous decisions. It was headed by Chief Justice Fred Vinson, who had repeatedly failed to forge unity on important issues. After hearing arguments on what was an explosive issue, the court delayed its decision, scheduling a rehearing of the entire case for late fall 1953. But before that, Chief Justice Vinson died of a heart attack. I was all of uh, 25 years old, and I was one of his clerks until September. Uh, he died uh, approximately two months after I arrived, and that is what provided the vacancy for the ultimate appointment of Earl Warren. President Eisenhower appoints Governor Earl Warren of California as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The 62-year-old Californian, shown here with his family... Well, you've probably read that Frankfurter said to his clerks at the time that the death of Vincent shows that there is a God. Not that he was glad that Fred Vincent had lost his life, but that at this particular moment in time, the change in the Chief Justiceship was so important. For old Warren hadn't become the Chief Justice when he did, the whole history of the country might have been different. He was a tough fellow, uh, although he gave a very genial appearance. He also was not a great intellect, but he had very strong principles, and he also had a very keen political sense, having been governor of California several times. People liked him almost immediately. I think they saw Warren being the kind of chief justice that could weld the court together in a way that perhaps Vincent had not been able to. We were very aware of the seriousness of the case. We literally did not know whether there would be blood in the streets as a result of the decision, regardless of which way it came down. It was very serious business. Everybody knew it was historic. There were hundreds of people lined up outside the court the night before, like a rock concert today. When you have something like the argument of the segregation cases, it brings out great crowds of people who would like to participate in viewing it. This is a part of the group of lawyers from all sections of the country who are here in the Supreme Court for the purpose of arguing the school segregation cases. There were a lot of arguments, you have to remember, but there's no question about the fact that the main focus was on John W. Davis and Thurgood Marshall. Here was Davis, run for president, it sort of come out of semi-retirement in order to, to argue this case for South Carolina. Davis would be a formidable opponent for the NAACP legal team having participated in over 250 Supreme Court cases during a celebrated career. Known for his rich baritone and incisive eloquence, he towered like a Goliath among lawyers. For Marshall, facing Davis was a personal challenge. As a young law student at Howard, he had admired him and many times heard Davis argue in the Supreme Court chambers. Davis was, in his cutaway and his starch collar and his grand appearance, he looked like a chief justice. And he gave a very persuasive argument. 
And then there was Thurgood Marshall, who really was responsible for making the court finally face up to the bare question, is it constitutional or is it a violation of equal protection to separate solely on the basis of race? He recognized, I think, one of the key foundations of his argument had to be morality and fairness. Before the highest court in the land, Marshall concluded, based on extensive legal and historical research, that the 14th Amendment was intended to prevent racial segregation in public schools. Davis argued the contrary and warned of the practical problems involved with desegregating. The court then adjourned, and Chief Justice Warren now went to work. During the next three months, he argued, persuaded, cajoled, and bargained with his colleagues. In the spring of 1954, assured he had achieved at least a majority, Warren began drafting an opinion for Brown versus the Board of Education. He called me in on April 29 and asked me to work on the opinion. He made it very clear that he wanted the opinion to be very readable, understandable to the layman. He wanted it to be of the sort of document that could be published in the newspapers. Warren hand-delivered his opinion to the other judges, including Associate Justice Robert Jackson, who was struggling with the legal ramifications of the case. Jackson had a heart attack, and he was in the hospital when Earl Warren brought his own draft of Brown around. And I, I really think that the, uh, the principal reaction that he had was one of relief. He said, I, I think it's something that I can agree to. Um, he said, uh, it doesn't, doesn't have much law, but on the other hand, it's so understandable. Monday, May 17, 1954, appeared to be a routine day at the court. I had no clue that it was going to come down that day, except that uh, Justice Reed, as he went out from his office, he came to my office, he said, Jack, this would be a good day to go in and hear the decisions. Jackson, against his doctor's orders, left the hospital on the day of the decision and came back, came into the back elevator and was there to take his seat with the court. Chief told us what was happening, so we were in the court. A number of the uh, clerks and other offices were out having lunch because they hadn't been told that and uh, deeply regretted it. And uh, there were a couple of other opinions that came down first. And then Warren announced that he had the opinion in Brown against Board. At 12.52 p.m., the Chief Justice began. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, deprive children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? We believe that it does. We conclude unanimously that the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Within 30 minutes, a change in the law that began with the actions and the courage of ordinary citizens in small communities was endorsed by the nation's highest court. It was incredibly dramatic and absolutely still in the courtroom. And then when he used that word unanimously, there was this intake of breath. It was really quite something. I mean, today, almost everybody looks back on Brown against the board as thinking, well, it was inevitable. Well, it wasn't inevitable at all. It had to be unanimous. Uh, had it been eight to one or seven to two or even five to four, it would have been horrible, I think, because there always would have been a question. Uh, you always would have been arguing about the two or the four who went the other way. But when all nine speak and all nine speak with the same voice, that meant something, and it meant something important. 